All right, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. I met a few people here. We're recording. All right, any questions before we begin? For those of you that have Wednesday lab, that's due today, the end of lab. We do have lab today. We'll be looking at multiple linear regression. All right, let's get started. So last time we talked, last Wednesday, we had just, just touched on multiple linear regression. And the idea is we have more than one covariate of information that we want to examine the relationship between that covariate and the response variable. The example we were looking at was avian species richness in the U.S. And the covariates were precipitation, temperature, and size of the state. So we have 51 data points, uh, 51 Ys, those are counts of species. And then we have other information about the state in which those data were collected. Uh, so we're interested in three potential. We have number of species at Y values shown with a color plot here. Then we have three different covariates, temperature, area, and precipitation. We see precipitation's highest in the southeast and also highest in the east compared to the west. Uh, area, Texas has the largest area. Hawaii and Alaska are included in here but aren't shown, so is Puerto Rico. And then temperature, we see gradient as we go from north to south. Uh, we talked about the, the general statement for multiple linear regression model where instead of just yi equals beta zero plus uh, one covariate, we have beta zero plus uh, as many covariates and other parameters that we are interested in. We still assume our, our residuals, epsilon i, come from a normal distribution with mean zero and sigma squared. And in terms of writing out these linear regression models, we can either write in x1 here, x2 here, for however many x's we have. D just represents however many covariates we have. And then later we can say what those are. x1 equals the area in the state, x2 equals temperature state, and x3 equals precipitation in the state. Alternatively, we could we could uh, stick something like area into X1, just put it right in here so we know that we're talking about X1 equals area. We talked about interpretation. There were two main interpretations. The intercept is the expected number of species when all of the covariates equal zero. And then in terms of interpreting the other parameter values, uh, we say something like all else being equal, the expected number of species increases by whatever this number is here. For area, it's this 3.855 times 10 to the negative fifth. Uh, species increases by this many units as area increases by one value of the x, and in which case that's square kilometers. And we say the same thing for the other. Uh, the other interpretations basically follow the same idea. All right, so here's about where we left out. Left out. We know what our general model statement is. I can write that. Okay, what's going on? Ah, here we go. Okay, we have, um, let me admit Matthew here. Okay, we have our general model statement. We start out with our data, yi. These represent our data. This in our example is the number of species in each state, i. That equals our intercept, beta zero, which we're gonna estimate, plus our parameter beta one, thank you, 
times our covariate, let's say area for state I plus beta two, uh, we can do uh, temperature. Actually, I'm gonna keep it the same as we had before, area temp precipitation. Beta two times temperature, average temperature of state I, plus beta three times the average precip in state I, plus our residuals for state I. What this looks like, we can say what these two look like. It's a plane where we have a X1 value for area and X2 value for temperature. And then beta one and two determine the shape of that plane in three-dimensional space. Uh, and then beta zero is where the uh, plane crosses all values of X, where X equals zero. However, when we get more than two covariates, we can't, our minds can't really process what that actually looks like. It's like some type of hypercube or something. Um, so, but the idea is still the same and the interpretation is still the same. So we can say that uh, as precipitation increases by one unit, the number of uh, species in a state is gonna increase by whatever this value beta three is. And beta three is estimated using R. Okay, now that's conditional on these values staying the same, meaning we're not we're only changing one variable at a time. All right, and then to finish out our general model statement, we say EI comes from a normal distribution with mean zero and varying sigma squared, and we're gonna estimate uh, sigma squared. So in our model, what we're trying to estimate are these values. And we know these values. So it goes back to the second day of class when we said, we know we want to examine if there's a relationship between our data and these predictor variables. And we want to estimate what that relationship is. And to do that, we have to choose a model and then we have to estimate parameters in that model. So we chose a multiple linear regression model and the parameters we need to estimate are shown here. The betas and the sigma squared. Where the betas represent the slope of the line of the, or the plane and sigma squared represents the spread around that line. And then EI is the distance between our data and that actual plane, that fitted model. Sometimes we call that plane or that line, if we're using simple linear regression, mu. So we could say, change the color, mu I equals just this part here the linear equation without the residuals. So mu i equals beta zero plus beta one area i plus beta two temp i plus beta three precip. And just as a, a reminder, we can rewrite this uh, using this mu i instead and just say, so this is y1 to write this, y2 to write this is y i equals mu i plus epsilon i, where epsilon i comes from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared, and mu i equals this thing here. There was one more thing I wanted to say about that. Oh yeah, I wanted to touch on this notation here, this tilde. We talked about that in lab two, where tilde represents a stochastic relationship 
meaning that it's going to follow this mean and this variance from the normal distribution. However, there's going to be randomness associated with that. And we use we looked at that R norm function to examine what that tilde actually does. So to talk about this in terms of data, we say that if we were to count the number of species yi, yi, on average, they would equal this function here, this mu i, but there's going to be some randomness around that, and that random values come from this stochastic distribution that's described by a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared. So these are going to be, these residuals are going to be centered around zero, but the spread of those is going to be described by sigma squared. All right, any questions on that? Let me take a second here. Pause for questions. That is simple and multiple linear regression. That is the, the uh, most basic and most wide used tool in all of statistics. And that's how we interpret it. And you can use this not only for wildlife, but in health fields, uh, psychology fields, economics, predicting stock markets, uh, anything. Whenever we're, we're, whenever we're interested in quantifying a, a linear relationship and quantifying something about the uncertainty, we can use simple and multiple linear regression. All right, let's go back to the notes. This is our general model statement I just wrote down on the whiteboard. Now let's take this output here and write out the fitted model statement. And I'm going to see if I can share my entire desktop. I can. OK. Uh, let's see. All right, so let's take this fitted. Can you see my desktop? Yeah, OK. Let's take this fitted model statement here that R has given us and plug in the right values for our general model statement over here. So let me write. Uh, general and then next we'll talk about the fitted model statement all right so we still start out with our data y i this is bird species richness. This equals uh, beta zero is given for us. And our estimate of beta zero is right here where it says intercept. And this is our estimate. 1.841 times 10 to the second. So that's 184.1 birds. Interpretation of this, when our covariates equal zero, that is when area equals zero, temp equals zero, and precip equals zero, there are on average 184 bird species in the state. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the way uh, we formatted the problem because how can an area of a state equal zero? Unless we do what we did back with the elk example and subtract off the minimum value for, in the case of elk, it was years. And in the case of birds, it would be um, the minimum area of the state. And then if we do that, subtract off the area of the minimum state, it's going to be the, the interpretation of beta zero is going to be the minimum, the expected number of birds when area equals whatever the area of the minimum state is. So that's how we can modify our data slightly by just subtracting off a value from our x's. Um, so that the intercept becomes more interpretable. But we haven't done that here, so let's roll with this. Okay, plus beta 1. And for our example, beta 1 equals uh, 3.855 3 times 10 to the negative fifth. So if we write 3855, our period was here. But we got to go to the left five spots. 
So I'll just give myself a little more room. So three, eight, five, five started here. One, two, three, four, five, zero, 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 zero. times uh, area. For state I. All right, plus beta two. And beta two in this example is 4.095 times temp in state I plus beta three, which is negative um, 2.4. Four five times precip in state I. All right, there, and then we have our epsilons come from a normal distribution. The mean's always going to be zero, and sigma squared is shown right here. It's forty five point five one. We have 47 degrees of freedom. This comes from our, our data, how many data points we have and how many parameters we're estimating, uh, plus one. So we had 51 data points because we included 50 states and Puerto Rico. We had um, one, two, three, four, five parameters. So minus five, and then there's always a plus one on here, and that equals 47 degrees of freedom. This isn't something we're going to talk about a ton in this class, but I just wanted to show how this 47 was calculated because it tells you something about the power of your sample says how many data points you actually have relative to the number of parameters you have. What was that phi value again? Five is how many parameters we had. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Um, how many parameters we have? How did I get that? Well, here's one parameter. That's beta zero. Here's two. That's beta one. Here's three. That's beta three. And here's four. That's beta four. And then sigma sigma is is five. So it's all of our betas plus our sigma. So this is an expectation of this class that first you can write out the general model statement here, know what each of these terms are, know what the data are, know what the parameters are, know what the covariates are, what the residuals are. I, um, write out this general model statement and then given some R output shown here, fill in this model statement with the correct values and then finally be able to interpret this model and say what it means in the relationship between our response variable and our predictor variable, predictor variables. Okay. Are there any questions? That is a huge, those models, linear regression, including simple and multiple, are a huge faction of statistics. And that's one of our main tools in wildlife. In future lectures, we're going to extend these again to account for different data types and make them more realistic for wildlife data. The other thing you'll need to know too are the assumptions of this model. So we talked about that. There were three of them. Independence of the data. Homoscedasticity, meaning the variance doesn't increase as you increase the x values. And then uh, that the errors are normal and have mean zero. All right, so in terms of our assumption, assumptions,
we want to ask, is this a good model? Does this model fit our assumptions? And we can use the same tools we talked about in simple linear regression to apply it to multiple linear regression. In fact, we can use um, the exact same command in R. We just plot our model statement to look at, first, are the data independent? Looking at this plot, I would say there's no evidence for lack of independence. Uh, are the residuals normally distributed? This 12th state here, again, these points are kind of supposed to follow along this line here to show that they're normally distributed. The one that really sticks out is this is this 12th point here. We can go in R and see what that 12th point is. And in fact, I think it's Hawaii. That it has a lot fewer number of species than uh, would have been predicted if we use the data from all other states. So someone asked about this in lab. Why is Hawaii so, have so, so few? I think it was Stephen. Um, and it's a good question, right? It seems like it's it's got, uh, well, let's see. The area is small. Temperature is good. Precipitation is probably pretty high. Um, however, you think of Hawaii, you think of maybe a lot of species. Uh, however, I think one of the reasons for that is the invasion of non-native species, things like uh, um, rats, other types of birds that are out competing some of the honey creepers and, and the native species of Hawaii. Okay, next assumption, are the errors heteroscedastic? That if they are, this line should go straight across. And this looks like they're pretty good. There's no evidence for lack of model fit here. Okay, the last uh, learning objective in this lecture was, let's take this idea of multiple linear regression and write out a mathematical function for our mu that gives us a little more flexibility than just a straight line or a straight plane uh, if in the case of one and two variables. So one thing we've talked about in the past, or one thing you've maybe seen in the past is looking at um, polynomials in a math class. Let's see. Polynomials in a math class where we would write something like mu i equals beta zero plus beta one x i plus beta two x i squared. So we just take our original value and square it. So in math, it may have looked like this. Uh, the notation for a calculus class would be something like y equals a plus bx plus cx squared. We're using the exact same idea, except we just use the beta notation because that's what's used in statistics. And in math, this was our function of x. So we have a function of x here. There's only one, one covariate in this function, and that's x. But we're doing two things to that covariate. We're saying first x and then x squared. Admit, Sarah. OK. Do you want to make me a co-host, Terry? Yeah. There we go. I thought you defaulted as one, but let's have to do it on each lecture. All right. And these are called polynomials. And we can use polynomials to go back to previous examples and make our models more flexible, make them more wiggly, basically. So recall we used simple linear regression with time as a covariate. So the x value was time, the year, to model change in elk abundance from 2005 to 2018. We only, so far we've only looked at a subset of the data. And I've only shown the 2005 to 2019, actually it should be 2019 because I just updated it for this year. Uh, 
we've only shown this much data, but actually I've been holding out the rest of the data so far until we had an opportunity to talk about polynomials. So we can see if we were looking at a, a single line for this data, it's not gonna work very well. We would plot it through here. We would have uh, errors that are not independent because they have this time series that goes up, down, up, or down, then up, and then down, and then maybe start to go back up again. So we need something better than a straight line to fit this, fit this data. And that's where polynomials are gonna come in. And we can use simple linear regression or multiple linear regression to fit polynomials to our data. So here's what I just showed on the whiteboard right here where we have y equals beta zero plus beta one x plus beta two x squared. And instead of a straight line, what we get from that is a polynomial. The shape and location of this line is gonna depend on our intercept and then the slopes for x and x squared. If we have a intercept that is 3000, that means the, the peak of this polynomial is gonna be right at 3000. And then the shape of the parameters for X and X squared, if they're negative, it's gonna be upside down. R is gonna give us the values of beta zero, beta one and beta two, if we just give it the data. We have to give it the data in the model, the model being uh, this function right here. And R is going to tell us what beta 0, beta 1, and beta 2 are. The best fit. All right, so for our multiple linear regression, it looks very similar to what we've already seen. We have our data yi come from a normal distribution with expected value mu i and variance sigma squared. And then mu i equals this polynomial here. And we can use this to model things that change in direction, like we saw with elk data from the 60s to the 2000s. We estimate beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, and sigma squared exactly like we did before. Let me blow this up a bit. We read in our, our elk data. We tell it what our y are, our, our response variable is, and that's our counts of elk. We tell it what our X is. This year, it's the year minus 1959. And then the only new thing we do is we say X2 equals X squared. So X is already defined right here. But now we're going to say, we'll just take this X and raise it to the second power, and that's going to give us X squared. And then we use the exact same LM function we used in simple and multiple linear regression where we have y tilde x plus x2, and that's gonna give us the values of our parameters. Beta zero is 1487, beta one is 869.618, and beta two is negative 14.842. Our sigma value is 2677. If we recall before, when we just had 2005 data to 2019 data, our sigma values was was something like 3,004 around that area. So our sigma value actually went down, even though we added a lot more data. And then everything else proceeds the same as we've already talked about. All right, so here's what that function looks like um, with the data. These uh, sigma squared values, let's see. L counts went way up over 15,000. Uh, for now, look at the, uh, the uh, black line here. That's the expected value. That's our mu value. So if we plug in the values of x, uh, from zero all the way to 60, that's what mu ends up being given these parameter estimates, the black line here, and that gives us the expected value. The I think the uh, salmon colored lines are the 
uh, are one 95 percent confidence interval away or one standard deviation away so they should capture about 68 percent of the data okay any questions about that that's our last slide on multiple linear regression we talked about let's go back to our learning objectives here Under, we understand how multiple linear regression is an extension of simple linear regression and when we can apply multiple linear regression that is when we have more than one covariate we're interested in uh, in the relationship between our response variable and our covariates uh, we we talked about how simple linear regression applies to multiple linear regression in terms of writing out general model statements and fitted model statements. We use the same functions we used for fitting data to R. It's the LM function. Uh, we had a couple slides on interpreting model parameters. The main difference there is we have to say all else being equal, one change in unit X responds to a beta value uh, corresponding change in units y and then model checking is exactly the same for multiple linear regression as it was for simple linear regression and lastly we talked about using polynomials in multiple linear regression to, to make models more flexible that is instead of a straight line we have a bendy line that we can fit the data so if you have data that look like they're bending or have a change we can use those polynomials to fit a model to those data any questions about that Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to uh, lecture five then. And lecture five is about model checking. Uh, model selection, not model checking. All right, model selection. Let me set up the problem here. Um, so far, we've talked about simple linear regression and multiple linear regression. Oh. Using the avian species richness data, we had potentially a lot of models that we looked at. We had, uh, let's say, um, yi comes from a normal distribution with mean mu i and variance sigma squared. That's our, our multiple linear regression model. Now, what can we use for mu i? In our, our avian species richness data, we had a lot of different options. We could say, mu i equals beta 0 plus beta 1 area if we thought area was the most important we could say alternatively let's say this is 1 this is 2 mu i equals beta 0 plus beta 1 uh, temperature if we thought temperature was the thing that was most driving species richness we could also say mu i equals beta zero plus beta one precipitation if we thought precipitation was really driving species richness. What if we think more than one of these things is driving species richness? Maybe it's area and temperature. Well, we can write out that model. Beta zero plus beta one area this is one area I plus beta two um, temperature I. Maybe it's just area and precipitation. Maybe it's um, temperature and precipitation. Oops, temperature. And we and in this last one, we don't think area is so important. Well, what we're trying to do is develop something over here that gives us 
a predictive ability for estimating what the mean in every state should be. So for example, if we did not have data on Alaska, can we plug in what the average precipitation, what the average um, temperature and the average area are into our model after we've gotten our parameter estimates and try and make a prediction on how many birds there should be in Alaska? Or can we use this model to look at Canadian provinces? So if we know what the precipitation temperature or area is in, in um, Northwest Territories, can we plug in our parameters here and try and get out what the expected number of bird species are? Can we use our model to try and predict a future response variable? And what we want to do is choose the model, whichever one of these are, that's going to give us the best predictive ability. So let's just finish writing this out. There are um, two more possible combinations that we could write out. Our seventh model could be mu i equals beta 0 plus beta 1 area plus beta 2 temp plus beta 3 uh, preset. And then our last one, mu i just equals beta 0, meaning we don't think area, temperature, or precip is going to help us calculate what the expected value is. We just think there's one value, one overall intercept that's going to give us the best estimate for any state. So that we that basically precipitation, area, and temperature have no predictive ability in telling us how many species to expect in an area. So we've developed eight potential models here, and we want to find one to make inference. And that's what model selection is, helping us choose the best model for predicting what our response variable is going to be in an area where we don't have data. All right. So in this lecture, we, um, we want to be able to understand the difference between classic inference and model selection. We want to know what a null model is, null model is, and how it's used for inference. A null model, in what I just wrote out, the example would be mu i equals beta zero. That means no covariates included. It's our basic, our basic intercept only model, and we're going to use that to compare all other models too. Um, we want to understand why we're considering multiple models, and that's what I just talked about, and that we have all, all these data, these covariates, and we want to try and predict, uh, we want to try and predict which covariates are going to be the most useful to us to help try and predict what our future response is going to be, or response in an area where we don't have data are. So exa for example, if we didn't have data in Nevada, which model is going to help us predict how many bird species are going to be in Nevada? And, and lastly, um, develop a set of candidate models consisting of simple and multiple linear regression to compare using our data. And that's what I was doing when I wrote out those eight different models. Those are the candidate models that we're going to consider. There are, I just wrote out eight models for our avian species richness example. But really, there's an in, if you consider all the polynomials we could add to this, uh, all the multiplicative interactions we could consider, there are an infinite number of models that we could consider. As scientists, we want to choose a small subset of models to consider. Those are going to represent our hypotheses. And we're going to use this approach called model selection, which is basically comparing a small subset of well thought out hypotheses and then use our our final best model to make inference on our population. All of these models are wrong, but some of them are useful. And this is a paradigm that's a little different uh, than the, in the way we do statistics now compared to way, the way we did statistics in Ronald Fisher's time in the 20s, 30s. 40s and 50s. George E.P. Box was married to Ronald Fisher's daughter. So there's a bit of statistical trivia. 
Okay, let's look at an example. And we kind of already covered this example briefly as we open this lecture. We have our avian species richness in the U.S. We have three different covariates we're considering. Here's our actual data, our Ys. Here's our temp, area, and precip. These are really just numbers on an Excel table, but they're shown out in two dimensions so we can see what they look like. Um, and the biological question we're interested in, are there correlations between avian species richness and the covariates temperature, area, and precipitation? So if we know something about temperature, area, and precipitation in an area, can we try and predict avian species richness? All right, we talked about these models. Here's the very first model we could look at. And this is all simple linear regression. So these consider each one of these covariates independently of each other. We only have one covariate in our model. And the first one, x1 equals area. And our second model, x1 equals temperature. And our third model, x1 equals precipitation. And then we have our simple linear regression model shown here. And then we talk about multiple linear regression, where we could have, we can consider all of these things simultaneously. So now we're putting area, temp, and precip in our model at the same time. We could only consider two of these at any one time, area and temperature, area and precip, okay. and temperature and precip. Repeat it, and, then dissolve the impurities. and then we have a null model. Me. Let me go to speaker oh, view okay. just for a second. Okay. All right. So now we have uh, our null model. And we talked about this. And this is a new concept today. A null model is an intercept only model. It means we have other data, our covariates, that can help us try and predict which species richness is. But maybe those things aren't really that important. Maybe all we need to know is the average. So in case of species richness, the a what beta zero is going to be is going to take all of our counts in our states and, and figure out what the average of them is and say, well, if we want to try and predict species richness in any state, just take the average of all other states. And that will be our best guess of what species richness is. That's what our expected value of species richness will be. But we still have our same. So, uh, our model statement here. And this is called our, our null model, and our null model is actually simpler than simple linear regression because there's no covariate in here. So then the question is, we have all of these different models, uh, eight of them so far. These are the ones I wrote out earlier, but now they're written out a little cleaner so we can see what they are. We still have our general model statement where mu i just equals diff has different potential possibilities. All potential models are known as our candidate models. They're the models we're going to consider. And the idea is going to be to choose one of these, the one of these that's best. And that's what model selection is. Let's use a clever way to figure out which model we have is best. OK, so uh, Ronald Fisher published this paper, actually this book, on the Mathematical Foundation of Theoretical Statistics in 1922. Uh, and as part of this book, he talked about first choosing which model you were going to use, then estimating the model parameters. Uh, he, used, he estimated them using um, likelihood. Likelihood is an approach that he developed, I think, when he was like 19. And it's a method we still use widely in statistics today. And then estimate how precise our models are, what the standard deviation, our parameters are, what the standard deviation or standard error of those parameters are. And as part of Fisher's um, uh, three aspects of Valor inference, he assumed that model structure is known and that we assume these, whatever model we use here, that that is actually the true model, the true mechanism that generated the data that we saw. So it would work very well for when we did our simulations. But as we mentioned before, with this quote at the beginning by George E.P. Box, was that we're not going to assume anything, any model is true. 
but we're just going to use it as a tool to represent a good approximation of reality and to try and help us predict what species richness would be. And then once we make a prediction, we can make management inference based on that. So if the National Forest Service is trying to uh, decide on where to put money into purchasing land, where can they purchase land that's going to give them the increased number of species as an example. So that's a tool. We're not going to assume the simple linear regression model that we use is true in that there was some true model generating the data, but just that it is a good approximation of reality. So the question here is, do we ever have a true model? And the answer is no. Ecology is really complex. There are so many things we can't approximate. So let's just incorporate that uncertainty. Um, there were three people that really changed the statistics in wildlife ecology. Uh, and they were based in Colorado State. They've been in various places throughout their career, Utah State, uh, Los Alamos National Research Lab in, in New Mexico as part of de defense. But these are uh, David Anderson, Ken Burnham, and Gary White. Ken Burnham's the statistician in the middle. He came up with a lot of these methods, actually borrowed these methods from, from statistics. They were already developed in statistics, then he applied them to wildlife. David Anderson's the champion. He's the one who pr promoted these ideas to wildlife ecologists. Um, uh, he championed them for a, most of his career and, and wrote a book saying we should be using these. And then Gary White's the, the person who helps implementing these by developing the program MARC, uh, which is which was previously used um, at the primary tool in looking at wildlife populations. So Gary wrote, implemented the methods of Ken into Mark, and these three, these three together combined, changed the uh, course of wildlife statistics. So Burnham and Anderson wrote a book called Model Selection and Multimodal Inference. The second edition was published in 2002, um, and they had two aspects of valid inference. Those consisted of formulation of a set of candidate models. That's what we just did, developing a set of models, and then using uh, model selection to select a model to base inference on. So we have our eight models we talked about already. Now the second task is to select which model we're going to use. There's a lot of thought that goes into the first step here, and that's where we come in as biologists. We have to think hard about which models to include in our model set. But after we have a model set, choosing a model is actually easy. Um, here's some slides that are included for your reference. So Ken Burnham and David Anderson wrote this book. This book has had a huge impact. Not They're both wildlife ecologists. However, this book has had a huge impact in all fields of science. And that's reflected in uh, the number of citations they've had. So this was last year. I think Ken Burnham's up. Actually, uh, David Anderson's actually up to about 200,000 citations now. Ken Burnham's at 110,000 citations. Just as a point of reference, E.O. Wilson, one of the most famous ecologists uh, of all time, is at about 192,000 citations. So as a point of reference, how influential this work and model selection has been, not only in the field of wildlife science, but in all, all fields of science. Okay, uh, formulate a set of candidate models is the first step. None of these models are assumed to be true models of reality, but we think they'll be useful. And the second goal is to um, identify a model that provides good approximation to the data available. While a model can never be a, tr a true model, uh, a model might be ranked from very useful to useful to somewhat useful to essentially useless. And that's what we're going to do with our model selection. So how do we choose our best model? In the past, people have used things like pseudo p-values, r-squared values, f-statistics, done things like stepwise selection or best subsets. So these are the methods you may have learned in a uh, introductory statistics course. But the dominant paradigm in wildlife ecology today is an informa information theoretic approach. And this is grounded in Kolbeck Library Information Theory. 
The examples include AIC, BIC, and DIC. We're going to focus exclusively on AIC in this class, and the goal is to find the best predicting model. This is used widely in wildlife ecology. So here's an example of the table. This, the next few slides are pulled from books, uh, journal issues, and the Journal of Wildlife Management. And this is essentially what we're going to learn in our next lecture, how to develop these tables, so how we can compare models for model selection. Here's an example of rough grouse nest selection and habitat selection, uh, distribution and habitat of Columbia torrent salamanders at multiple spatial scales. And the idea with these slides here is that it's all the same table. So once we learn how to develop these table, we can, we can do um, research grade science. Uh, we choose the best performing model based on the lowest AKIKI information criterion. That's what AIC stands for. Okay. My slides say I have 23, but actually I just, uh, 31, but that's uh, some type of error. Actually, there's only 23 slides. So that's it for this lecture. Uh, and we'll pick up on actually how we're going to do AIC on, on Monday. So I'll stick around for any questions from now, and I have office hours, uh, office hours at 10, and they can just uh, officially start now if you have any questions. So thank you. Um, I had a quick question, if, if no one else has any. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this one's actually pertaining to the lab we just did. Um, uh, my partner and I got kind of like two separate um, formulas going on and where did it go? Sorry, I'm trying to look at it. So for the first part, um, for question two, where it says fit those three simple linear regression models, um, we came up with two different responses to that. And originally I was getting tripped up because I was visualizing it as like, our y axis versus our x axis and we wanted that x axis to be like super smooth so originally we identified y as the area data column and then x as just 1 to 51 and so we were plotting like three lines of just that pure covariate data without the species at all um, and then we got kind of like, that's weird. Like, shouldn't we include the response yeah. variable? So then the second time we made Y equal to species and then the X equal to the area column. And so the species was always the Y and the covariate changed each time. And so we were just wondering between the two, like which one, we're assuming we should stick with the Y, but we just got weirded out because we looked at the X axis and we were like, that's not a very clean X axis when like we're using all of the area column. Yeah, okay. So your response variable, you're right. You're on the right. I mean, I think you're right, essentially. Why are the number of species, right? Yeah. That's what we're interested in. So you can subset that data frame and say y equals the number of species. And your x are going to be either one of the three covariates. Which one are you looking at? Area? Area? So your x would be the areas. Okay. Yeah. So, that's so yeah so when you do lm y tilde x you set y equal to the species and x would be the area um that one to a point of clarification here is that one to 51 that would not be anywhere in there unless you were doing something associated with time okay so that's what's how that's different from the elk data where elk we were interested in the time so that in that case we set x equal to the time but now we're interested in the relationship, not between um, Y and time, because time's nowhere in the data. All these data were collected at one period. Um, but you're interested in Y and these other covariates, these spatial covariates, uh, X, uh, area, precip, and temp. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I just was always like trained to think of X as like time just because that's simple and that's how I always saw it. So then when yeah. I didn't see it as time, I was like, oh, maybe that's wrong. But that makes sense because we're looking at the relationship between the two variables and not mm -hmm. like a constant year after year. Right, right. 
for this example, the way the data were collected. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's a good point of clarification too, because oh. we jump right off into the ALK data where X is in fact time, and then we switch to something where X is not time, but it's more space. Okay, and then my um, last question I think was, so I was getting a little tripped up because like, it was, it was a simple linear regression lab, but like it also had multiple covariates. So I think for 2C, it was asking which covariate has the strongest mean effect. And I kind of like watched your multiple linear regression lab again and just used the summary of the whole um, model, including all covariates, and then use that summary model to find the beta value that had the biggest impact. But then I was like, maybe that's not what we want since it's a simple linear regression model. So could we also just look at each um, slope of each simple linear regression and the biggest slope theoretically would have the biggest impact? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. But in the future, we could do it either way. We could also use the summary of the model that includes all the covariates. If you were doing multiple linear regression and you want to figure out which one had the biggest impact, you could use the multiple linear regression and look at the size of the beta values. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That was super helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I have a question. Uh, so I was working on the lab yesterday on campus and everything was running. So I emailed it to myself. Um, and then when I tried opening it on my computer at home, it wasn't running. How did you, did you, um, when you saved it, what did you name it? Um, I just named it the NRES 48, 488, um, with our names and as in our in our studio package. Did you, one thing you need to do sometimes with scripts um, <laughs> is put a dot R at the end of it. Okay. So maybe you can just rename your file. Um, um it's opening, like I can see everything, but um yeah. I try to run the first one where we Oh, okay. It opens okay file. Okay. Um, it says error every time I, I could try sharing my screen with you. Yeah, that'd be great. I have to make you a co-host and I can do that. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to grab a cup of coffee while you're doing that, but I have headphones on so I can still hear you. Okay. Okay, so my guess, ah, yeah, I see what. So what you have to do every time you switch computers mm -hmm. is tell it where this birds.csv file is saved. Okay. So birds.csv is like an Excel-like file saved somewhere on your computer, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you'll have to download that in a folder. When you open our studio, it doesn't, it can't like search all paths in your computer mm -hmm. uh, by itself. You have to tell it where to look. Okay, so even though I imported it, that's not enough. Oh, so you have it imported. Go to the next. Okay, what you can do now since you imported it is you have the birds um, birds file saved in your data, but mm -hmm. it's not it's not called data yet. So if you uh, go to the next line and just say, capital D A T A equals birds. That should work. There you go. So now you, so now you have birds there. You already had an object called birds. Let's see. Yeah, the first one won't work unless it's reading from a file where it knows where it is. So you must have used our studio to load that in, right? Yeah, and I did. Then, 
So that means you don't need to use line 15 because what you did is an alternative for line 15. Oh, okay. How, however, when you loaded it in, you didn't call it the object called data. Mm -hmm. Now it's a little confusing because up here it says on your top right, right, um, in your top right in the global environment it says data and then it says birds, but that yeah. always says data. Always says data up there. So maybe data isn't the best name to call that object, um, but that's what I called it. And okay. Um, so now everything should be the same. You can even type in data down in your console on the bottom left. And it should give you your data file. Yeah. There okay. You go. I see it. Yeah. So now try running everything, running else everything. and see if it works. Yeah. Yeah, looks like everything looks good. Oh, um, I did have a, another question about part five. Um, yep. I was a little confused when it came to the sigma part on part F. Um, did Is this the correct way to do it? Let's see, sample your N equals 1000 residuals from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation sigma. Recall that our norm function from lab one also note that R uses standard deviation, not the variance. So you will have to take the square root of sigma squared using sigma squared. Sigma, oh, let's see, epsilon, sample, your, uh, you're gonna use uh, the R norm function and not the sample function. Okay. Sample, yeah. Yeah, um, yep, that's exactly right, right there. You got it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, that's right. So, All right. Any other then, questions? Um, because I was stuck on that one, I didn't do the rest of five, but um, I'll do the rest of five. And if I have any questions, I'll send out an email. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Are you, you in Are you in lab today? Yeah, I am in lab, but I um, I told Julie beforehand that we were having some trouble and she said she was free before lab so we could um, contact her if we needed to. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome.